Join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. You will hear a woman phoning an electrical repair company about a problem with a piece of household equipment. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Hello, Sinclair Electrical Services, Kevin speaking. Oh, good morning. Um, I believe you do television repairs. That's right, we do. Well, my television's not working, but I don't have a car. Can you come round to see it? That shouldn't be a problem. Good. <laughs> Can I just take a few details then? Certainly. So, if I could start with your name? Yes, it's Mrs Douglas. D-O-U-G-L-A-S? It's double S at the end, actually. OK. And the address? 135 Park Hill Avenue. In Somerton? That's right. And would you like my phone number? Yes, please. It's 765-482. 428? No, 82. OK. Right. So, what's the problem with the television? Um, low volume. Even when you turn it up to maximum, it doesn't seem to make much difference. I mean, it's quite an old TV, but it's always worked perfectly well up to now. And the picture's OK. Mm. I did wonder. We had a power cut a couple of days ago, and it's not been right since then. I don't know if that could have affected it. It certainly might have something to do with it. Anyway, I'll come over and have a look. Uh, can you tell me the make and model number by any chance? The number will be on the back of the TV. Mm, um, yes, it's uh, Schneider. That's S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R. And the model number's... Um, let me see. Yes, it's s v 5 2 Right. Is that a fairly recent model? Mm, not really. I got it seven years ago. I remember the date because it was the year after I moved into this house and that was eight years ago. I hope you can fix it. I really don't want to buy another one. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Well, I'll see what I can do when I come round to the house to look at it. I think I know your road. Is it the one that's off the high street? That's right. The house is on the left if you're coming from the high street, just before the road bends to the right. I'm afraid it's getting harder and harder to park on the road, but if you drive on round the bend, you can usually find somewhere. That's all right. Now, let's see. When would it be convenient for me to come round? Well, as soon as possible, really. Well, what's today? Friday. I'm booked up today, and then we've got the weekend, so I'm afraid it looks like Monday morning's the earliest. You can't come tomorrow? Well, Saturday morning I'm in the showroom, and I don't work Saturday afternoon and Sunday. OK. I'll make sure I'm in. Oh, and one last thing. I wonder if you'd mind telling me how you heard about us. We've just opened a new web page, and we're interested to see how effective it is. No, I actually heard about you from the woman next door. She couldn't remember your number, but I looked it up in the phone book. Oh, right. It's always the best advertising, word of mouth. Right. OK. Thank you, Mrs Douglas. Thank you. Goodbye. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 2. You will hear a presenter on a radio phone-in show. The presenter is talking to a woman who was bitten by a poisonous spider. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 13. Today we're continuing our traveller's tales. On the line we have Amanda Toddington, who had quite a nasty experience in Australia last year. Isn't that right, Amanda? Yes. My husband and I were on holiday and we were staying at a friend's house on the coast near Brisbane. It was towards the end of the holiday and I was about to go into the garden and enjoy my breakfast. I walked out into the kitchen, slid my left foot into my shoe, and felt a tiny sting. It was pretty painless, but I shook the shoe off my foot and saw this tiny spider running out as the shoe hit the wall. Anyway, not being an expert, I presumed the worst, that I'd been bitten by something that was going to kill me, and I completely lost control. I don't think I've ever screamed so much in all my life. We've been told beforehand to always check our shoes before putting them on, as it's a common way to get bitten. So I suppose it was my own fault, really. So what was it that had bitten you? Tony, that's our Australian friend, he immediately asked me if I knew what had bitten me, and I pointed to the corner of the room where I'd last seen the spider. He picked up a jar and found the creature in the corner where the shoe had hit the floor. It's a red back, he said, and he gently placed the jar over the spider. The funny thing was, we'd been talking about some of the creatures we needed to be careful of a few days previously, and as he said the name Redback, the conversation came flooding back to me, in particular the fact that the bite can be extremely painful. I've found out since that the Redback is from the same family as the Black Widow Spider, and it's the female that does the damage, which it turned out was what I'd been bitten by. Before you hear more of the radio show, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 15. You must have been absolutely petrified. You can say that again. I remember feeling quite confused. I wasn't in a great deal of pain to begin with, and yet I could see from our friends' faces that they were concerned. Tony explained that the venom or poison of the bite spreads quite slowly, so the pain doesn't feel too bad at first. Gwen, Tony's wife, brought an ice pack, and Tony held it against the bite to make it less painful. Apparently, you're not supposed to put a bandage on the area, as this can make it hurt even more. Uh, Tony tried to put my mind at rest by explaining that this was quite a common bite, that the hospital would have an anti-venom, and that everything would be okay. But I was beginning to panic. We were flying back to the UK the next day, and I really didn't know what to do. Before you hear more of the radio show, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 18. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 18.
So what did you do? Well, Tony phoned the doctor, who told him to check my symptoms for the next hour or two. As time went on, the pain became very intense, from my foot right up to my knee. My husband was on the internet and was reading out the possible symptoms. I wasn't feeling sick, and I hadn't yet developed a fever, but I had a terrible headache, and my foot was beginning to swell up. At this point, Tony decided to take me to the local hospital to be on the safe side. I really didn't want to go, as I had visions of being kept in for days and all our plans being spoilt. But Tony and my husband insisted. When we got to the hospital, I was relieved to see how casual everyone was when Tony explained I'd been bitten by a red-back spider. They told me to take a seat and got on with their work. Before you hear the rest of the radio show, you have some time to look at questions 19 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 19 to 20. And did you receive any treatment? By the time I got to see a doctor, the pain was very intense indeed and I was getting quite upset. The doctor decided to give me a dose of an antivenom, which he assured me would eventually deal with the problem. Unfortunately, he also explained that it wouldn't have an immediate effect and the symptoms might last for several days. But the story has a happy ending. My husband managed to book us onto another plane one week later. And even better news was that the symptoms of the bite finally cleared up after about 24 hours. Within a couple of days, I was back to normal again. So thanks to the spider, we managed to extend our holiday by a week. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear a female and a male student talking about the mock exams that they have just taken. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, what did you think of the practice exams last week? You mean the mock exams? Yeah. I thought some of them were tough. They were certainly hard and generally they were very long. Yeah, they were spread over a whole week, which made it impossible to relax. Exactly. But what did you think of each test? Of the seven exams we did? The least enjoyable for me were the two three-hour essay papers. Why didn't you like the essay papers? I'm not particularly good at writing things down like that in a short space of time. And I don't think it's a good way of testing our theoretical knowledge of medicine. I'm the opposite, I'm afraid. I'm much better in the written essay exams than the other types of tests. But what about the two multiple-choice exam papers in basic science and anatomy? They weren't too bad. If you didn't know the answer, all you had to do was guess. Mm, that's okay, but I never feel comfortable with guessing. And you know that there is research that shows that women are disadvantaged when doing multiple choice questions compared to men. You've mentioned this before, but I'm not sure I believe it. It's true. Multiple choice questions benefit men more than women. They are a male construct. If you say so. It's not if I say so. 
Anyway, you have to be careful with multiple choice questions because of the negative marking. That can really bring the score down if you keep guessing and get all of the guesses wrong. It's double negative. Yeah, that is a danger. What about the role play? Did you like that? Yeah, with the actors and actresses as simulated patients. Yeah, I thought that was by far the best part of the exam. Why was that? What I liked about it was during the 24 test stations, we had a chance to show what we know about communicating with patients and show our practical medical knowledge, etc. Yes, I think I agree with you there. I enjoyed all of the stations, but I can tell you I was tired at the end. I have done a practice exam with 12 test stations, but not 24. It was exhausting, but also exhilarating. I agree completely. It lasted nearly four hours in total with the break. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. What did you think of the other two exams? The two problem-solving tests? Hmm, I didn't think I was going to handle them very well. But in the end, I think they went better than I thought they would. What I liked most was the test where we had to work in groups of four and to solve a problem, we had to prioritise actions. That was very interesting. I'm not sure that I did very well in that, though. Did you feel comfortable being in a group of four and having four examiners watching you as you discuss the problem? We did practice it several times before. You learn to forget that someone is watching you. But some people are better at speaking in group situations like that and they get the best marks. The test doesn't just assess whether people can talk a lot. It's about showing you can listen Organise your thoughts and then show you can be part of a team, allowing other people to speak. Well, we'll have to see how it goes. When do the results of the mocks come out? They said next week, and then it's the finals two weeks later. Yeah, we've got that to look forward to. What is the policy on resets? Why? Are you planning to fail? No, but, well, you know what I mean. The resets are held in September, and if there is any problem after that... It goes to appeal. We'll just have to make sure we don't fail any part of the whole examination. I certainly wouldn't want to do any of it again. Me neither. It's hard when you are not allowed to fail any of the exams. I bet they don't have that policy in any other subject. Probably not. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about sport in Ireland. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Now today we're going to be finding out about the most popular sports in the Emerald Isle. That's Ireland, of course. Can you guess what they are? Well, there are these two lesser played games, a form of rounders and Gaelic handball. But we'll start with one which is perhaps over 3,000 years old arriving in Ireland with the Celts, some claim. 
That may be a slight exaggeration, but I consider it to be the fastest field game in the world, and it goes by the name of hurling. Well, that's what it's known as in the English-speaking world anyway. So, what do you have to do? You've got 15 players on a team, one of them the goalkeeper. Each one has a stick called a hurley. Here you are. I've brought mine along. Had it since I was at school. This is what it looks like, and basically you have to get this ball, called a schlitter, that's S-L-I-O-T-A-R, so it's not spelt the way it's pronounced. You hit it into the net for three points, or you can hit it over the net for one point. The goal looks like the letter H, with the net under the crossbar. The goalie has a bigger stick than the others to help keep the ball out. You can also catch the schlitter and run with it for four steps maximum, or bounce it on your stick. Is that clear to you all? I'll be showing you a video a bit later, so you can see what a game actually looks like. You might like to think of it as a mixture of lacrosse, hockey and baseball. Oh, and it's played by women too, but it goes by the name of Komogi in that case. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. I'll give you a bit of the history, shall I now? Generally, the golden age of the game is considered to be the 18th century. But systematic rules were first agreed and drawn up at that great shrine of learning, Trinity College Dublin, in 1879, founding the Irish Hurling Union closely followed just a few years later by the formation of the Gaelic Athletics Association. With greater organisation last century, the All-Ireland Hurling Championship got off to a flying start, and I'm proud to say that my own native city of Cork has won more than 20 titles over the years. But then, so have Kilkenny and Tipperary. Is it only played in Ireland? No. Well, it is the only country with a national team at the moment, but you may be surprised to discover there are hurling clubs in London, as well as in America and Argentina, to name just a few. The other game I'd like to take a little time to introduce you to is Gaelic football, which is played on the same pitch as hurling with the same number of players, but there is no net. You just have to get the ball over your opponent's goalposts. And you can do that by kicking or punching the ball. However, you're not supposed to do that to the players, I might add. Imagine it as a combination of soccer and basketball. But in my opinion, it's a more exciting spectacle than either of those. Excuse my bias, if you will. It's also very popular with women. In fact, there are more women's teams than for any other sport whether despite or because of the physical contact involved, I wouldn't like to say. They do play a shorter game, 60 minutes, rather than the men's 70. So, let's have a look. If we can have the lights down, I'll see if I can get this technology to work. You now have half a minute to check your answers.